So continuing on with the parasite concept, now we're gonna look at what we call ectoparasites. And so we enter a brand new phylum. Uh, this is referred to as arthropoda. And what's really unique about here is that we're gonna subdivide it into a couple of um, subphyla, as well as some classes that are really interesting to us in microbiology. So the reason why we focus on arthropods is because they're vectors. These are gonna be the uh, guys that carry the bad guys and transmit them onto us. Now, what's unique about arthropods, the term arthropod, meaning uh, segmented legs or jointed legs is really where they go, um, meaning that these are things that kind of creepy, uh, creepily crawl all over you kind of thing. Uh, what's unique about all arthropods is that they usually come in three pieces or two pieces of their bodies with legs kind of extending from them. But uh, as opposed to us, we usually kind of have this kind of fleshy kind of uh, external portion. They kind of have a little bit more of a harder version of protection on the outside called an exoskeleton. Now, the reason why we study this field is because, uh, as they mentioned before, they can carry the organisms and they can serve in two ways, just as literally a transport system, nothing else, and that's usually called a mechanical vector, or sometimes they serve as carriers in which they kind of feed them, grow them, and do other things for them. And at that point in time, they're referred to as biological vectors. So what we're gonna look at here under the phylum arthropoda is two classes. Class one is known as arachnida, and class two that we're interested in is class insecta. So here is what you're really looking at is the arachnids and the insects. Now, what's unique about them is you guys will know them as spiders and bugs, right? Clearly, you know, not all spiders have some sort of issue against us, nor do all bugs. But a small subset of each of those two classes is what's really interesting for us, right? So let's look at them kind of individually and just kind of for the sake of entertainment, we'll start kind of covering probably the spiders first, right? So commonly uh, uh, misassociated with being bugs, Spiders under the uh, class arachnida are considered to be arachnids, and there's one unique reason why you should focus on them, is that arachnids have eight legs. Bugs usually have six, right? So that's the biggest difference. Now, under arachnids, what's uh, cool about them is that they do have an extra set of kind of mini appendages, so not the legs, more than that. Uh, they're referred to as the chelicerae. Now, the term chelicerae uh, comes from their subclassification, also called chelicerata which are the little things that you're seeing kind of sticking out of their faces, right? And they're usually used to eat most of the time. And then they also have these, all their extra little appendages called the pedipalps, which is what you normally see as these little kind of extra little hands sticking in front of them to grab things and use things. Now, what's unique about spiders or arachnids, in this case, and all the group of cool ones in there, uh, is the fact that they definitely do not have antennae, so no, uh, little uh, things sticking out of their forehead, right? Nor do they have wings, which again, I assume that you all would be safer or feel safer if you didn't see flying spiders, right? Now, in terms of their segmentation, uh, they do come with uh, one of the two segments kind of separate and the other two kind of are fused together. And so their butt or their abdomen, more or less, the part that most people see about arachnids, is called the opisthosoma. Um, and that's the clear one that you can see on most of these guys. But then the portion of the head, the cephalon, and their torso, the thorax, usually in arachnids are kind of fused together. So their head and their uh, body are kind of stuck together. So no neck, if you want to think about it that way. And that's called the prosoma or cephalothorax. Now, out of the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these that exist, I'm sure you're all familiar with most of their variations from your classic spiders to your scorpions and things like that. But there's only a very limited few that we're interested in. But really kind of what we wanted to focus on is clearly uh, a little bit of the traumatic effect that we want to explain things like, you know, some fun, you know, camel spiders and things like that and how much larger they get. Um, and usually kind of the scary factor associated with them. So YouTube is a fun thing for that. But really for us, we're not going to deal with spiders. We're actually interested in one of their set of cousins known as the ticks or the mites, um, also uh, known as chiggers, if you've ever heard that term in the South. 
right? So here, what's unique about the ticks and the mites is that pretty much found everywhere in the world, okay? And pretty much they are the uh, carrier. They are the vector on the planet, right? So ticks, more than anything else, um, happen to uh, virtually carry all the uh, crazy and disgusting little bugs that are trying to eat you and kill you. Uh, probably the most infamous of them all is the one that causes Lyme disease, which happens to be starting to popularize itself, not only in terms of uh, quantity, but also the fact that people are starting to use it as an excuse uh, to go a little bit more on social media, believe it or not. And so Lyme disease is caused by this wonderful little bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi. So for those of you who remember that from our classification in bacteria, that's that guy right there. But it is carried by ticks. So for those of you who are hunters, for those of you who like to hang out in woodsy type areas, or if you have pets that kind of run around in the backyard kind of thing, that's one of the bigger risks uh, that you observe. And so we're going to look at ticks and we're going to look at mites uh, just briefly to kind of see what's unique about them. One of the unique concepts about these guys is that their teenager years is that, so their juvenile stage are six-legged, even though all our arthropods, are, are, sorry, our arachnids come with eight, right? And so what's usually important about these guys is their blood meals. So they end up usually trying to bite you and they stick that chelicerae that we had talked about before um, in other pieces of their body called opistosomas, um, in their opistosomes, sorry, uh, that kind of cut you, open you, stick to you, hold on to you, glue you, uh, a little bit of liquefy you, and then absorb you too. So they're really, really kind of handy little tools, all right? So uh, probably the most infamous of all the ticks is called Dermacentor. Um, the one you're seeing up there is the common tick that you're all familiar with. And these are known as what we call the hard-bodied ticks, right? And the idea is that these ones are kind of transmitted as mechanical vectors because all they're really use, kind of trying to do is kind of jump on you and then when they kind of use their chelicerae, like I said before, they kind of um, cut open through this little tool called a uh, hypostome and they kind of attach themselves to you. And so while they're doing that, they're kind of absorbing your blood, right? That's what most ticks usually do. But during those blood meals, that's the issue is that they can pass on organisms like Borrelia burgdorferi and cause things like Lyme disease. That's one of the bigger issues, right? And so most of you probably have recognized this, especially if you've had pets, right? Now, on the other uh, extreme of our arachnids, here we have our mites. Again, chiggers is the other term you've probably heard before. Um, and probably the infamous one of them all is Sarcoptes scabii, which in this case, not Lyme disease kind of carrying, this guy kind of likes to hang out on you and causes a wonderful little disease called scabies, which happens also to be a sexually transmitted infection. Now, what's interesting about this guy is that it causes some insane amount of itching. That's uh, the term that you're seeing in there on the left-hand side, especially if you're gonna be in the medical field. We don't like to call it itching. We like to call it pruritus or pruritus, depending on who says it. It really means itchiness, right? And so this guy goes through several stages from egg to kind of baby to teenager to adult. And so what this guy does is that the um, female usually kind of goes under your skin to lay eggs. So that's where the itchiness kind of really begins. And so you going to kind of scratch it is really what spreads them out the most. And so what will happen is once the uh, guys kind of hatch, uh, you will more or less notice that... Um, the teenager versions of them, sorry, the youngling versions of them will go to the skin and then they'll start kind of molting a little bit and start burrowing themselves again or kind of digging into your skin to kind of repeat the cycle. Now, what normally will happen though is that once males and females kind of you know, find themselves and mate, then what will, do, what will happen is the female will just permanently stay under your skin laying those eggs for the rest of its life. So the females are the ones that end up causing the damage to the skin and the um, itchiness associated with it. Now that's one version of these uh, uh, arachnids. This is your classic itch mite. Probably the other one that you should be familiar with is your dust mite. And so uh, that's known as dermatophagoides. And so here's kind of a liberal, uh, uh, little variation of these guys. And so what I'm gonna go in here is just kind of show off what this guy looks in three dimensions. This is what probably one of the hardest ones to actually see 
uh, because they're relatively transparent. And when you try and put them on slides, they kind of collapse a lot simply because of their exoskeleton. So it makes it a little bit challenging to see at times, but we'll still see them in the lab. But if you ever want to see one kind of up close, like the guy that you're seeing over here, just stop by the off my office hours and you'll see my entire lab kind of coded in these guys all over the place. So yes, I'm offering you itch mites in case you haven't figured that one out. Right now, dermatophagoides is probably my favorite of our arachnids that we get to study here. Um, and simply because this is your classic dust mite. So this is the one that you find on your carpets, for those who have carpets at home, especially if you're sitting on one of them right now. Um, but you'll also find them anywhere between your couches, your beds, your curtains, your towels, and everything else. Now, the reason why this guy is an issue is because of the fact that it's usually consuming you. Now, it doesn't do it directly. Instead, it survives off the detritus, meaning the leftovers, the uh, dead skin cells that are falling off of you. And so what will happen is these guys will find it on the carpet, will find it on the couch, whatever you want to envision in there, and they'll consume it. They'll consume your dead self. But then what will happen is their feces that they produce are basically relatively toxic and not in the horrible kind of crazy way, but more or less they like to cause breathing problems. And it can actually be one of the bigger triggers of, um, of asthma. So especially people that um, um, have or have some sort of tendency towards asthmatic bouts, uh, these guys happen to contribute to them a lot. Now, these guys only last about 20 days or so uh, in terms of their life cycle. Um, and usually what happens, though, is that um, if they mate speci specifically, the females can live up to a couple of months pretty much laying uh, several eggs per day, um, especially getting up to the uh, dozens of them in the last few days of their life cycle. And so within, you know, you know, a couple of months of uh, time, in this case, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of eggs. Each one of them that eventually hatches can produce several thousand uh, fecal particles, which contribute to this kind of um, contaminated air, if you will. Now, the reason why we're going into this is to that kind of traumatize you a little bit more behind where you sleep. And so keeping in mind that, you know, uh, these dust mites are pretty much everywhere. They're ubiquitous and they don't really cause you harm aside from the, uh, the disgusting things that they're consuming. And so a proper uh, cleaning etiquette is really the best way to do so. Um, there are uh, certain pesticides that can be kind of fumigating your house if you really want to go after that. But most of the time, they'll end up kind of coming back. Now, what's crazy about this is the fact of what they contribute towards you. And so most commonly, again, you, anytime you vacuum, you're kind of raising them up into the air. You're aerosolizing them and just kind of making the situation worse unless you have some really good vacuum cleaners that have really good like filters, like HEPA filter level kind of stuff. But those vacuums usually end up being in the $500, $750 level. Most people don't end up buying those. Right. So pretty much what you end up doing most of the time is kind of just shifting them around everywhere uh, you go. So here we enter our insects or class insecta, for those of you familiar with that term. So this is your classic bug, definitely not to be confused with your arachnids, again, your spiders, right, or those ones that have eight legs. Here, these guys have six legs and they definitely can have antennae and they can definitely fly. Right. And then what's unique about them is also that their bodies now have clearly defined heads, torsos and butts, basically, or the head, thorax and abdomen. What is the cephalon, the thorax and the abdomen itself. So now you can kind of clearly see them apart as opposed to our arachnids. But again, the key features here is, again, that they have six legs as opposed to eight. Now, here, as our vectors that we're interested in, we're going to look at things like fleas and lice. And we've already kind of established some certain cases like mosquitoes. But I did want to highlight one that is kind of fun, which is what you're seeing down there. Um, his name is Kyle. He's Kyle the kissing bug. And usually we have him kind of trapped in a, side, a little bottle in the lab. So part of our demonstrations includes you seeing Kyle. Now Kyle happens to be these wonderful little groups of bugs referred to as kissing bugs simply because they kind of love CO2, 
they seem to be attracted to carbon dioxide. And so the places where we produce most of our carbon dioxide happens to be from our nose and our mouth. And so these guys love to kind of hang out while you're sleeping and get really close to your nose or mouth and then stab you as a way to get a blood meal. Now, the blood meal is not the problem. Here, as they're kind of getting uh, uh, their blood meal, the same concept like dermatophagoides earlier is that their feces usually carry certain organisms that are dangerous to you. And what happens is because they bite you, they leave this little bit of an itchiness factor left over there. And after they're long and gone, you will scratch it and you're the one that makes it worse because now you're introducing those fecal particles into the wound that they left. They don't actually do it, you do it. So it's part of that adaptation that they have in which these cool little kissing bugs leave these little uh, dots of damage onto your face, usually again closest to your mouth, not necessarily always, but that's usually their place of focus. And then after their blood meal and leaving feces, then they'll kind of, uh, you will make the situation a little bit worse. So let's look at some of their cousins, right? So under uh, this wonderful group of bugs or insects, probably one of the more common ones that everybody's familiar with are your, in this case, uh, wingless versions of them are your fleas. So these ones don't actually fly, they just jump really, really high. And so Pulex irritans is the guy that you're seeing here and kind of let me show you kind of the breakdown of what it looks like. Um, the reason why this guy is bad is not necessarily because of a blood meal or anything else, it's simply because it's always found in uh, these other uh, vectors out there like birds and rodents that carry other diseases. But this guy definitely can carry tapeworms. So one of them, uh, the infamous ones behind it is dipolidium. And then probably uh, the more infamous of them all that you're all familiar with history, if you've not seen any just silly little movie, is the plague, right? So uh, it can carry this wonderful little organism called Yersinia pestis, part of our proteobacteria, for those of you who remember that, right? Um, and so the other thing they can do is also transmit tons of different other uh, viruses, other bacteria, and even certain types of protists out there. So kind of an important vector out there. Now, um, we will actually observe this guy in the, in the lab too, so I'll show you some cool little um, anatomy of Pulix. Now, the other one that you probably should be familiar with is um, Pediculus. Now, Pediculus, uh, unfortunately, is the correct name, and but most people end up uh, mispronouncing it, probably because of some weird Harry Potter thing. Uh, you'll hear the term called pediculosis. And so in reality, pediculosis is the disease. Uh, pediculus is the name of the actual organism. And depending on where you find it, it has a little bit of a subclassification. So if it's capitis, you find it in the head. If it's corporis, you fall in, in, in the body, and so on and so forth. And so pediculus humanus, which happens to be the human louse, okay, uh, corporis is the body louse in this case. And the reason why these guys are very, very interesting is, well, you all are familiar with lice, right? And so they have these kind of basic three stages of life in which they can lay eggs called nits, right? They'll hatch into a kind of a young adult version called the nymph, and then they make it to their adult stage. Now, uh, for those of you who've ever had lice or children that have displayed lice, that kind of thing, um, you've all kind of dealt with it of cutting hairs and washing hair and using certain substances to kind of kill them. Really, the easiest way to kind of get rid of lice is removing the hair itself. Why? Because it's the actual key survival of pediculus is that those little arms that you're seeing, those little claws that you can actually almost detect is what grabs onto hair. And so without hair, these guys can't reproduce. So you take away the hair, they cannot lay eggs. So ultimately they kind of die out. So literally the hair is the critical factor here, right? So um, preventions also usually rely on more than anything else, cleanliness. So it's pretty easily dealt with. But one of the key issues is that it spreads like no other because these guys can jump really well too. And so as long as they have access to hair and somebody else close by, they can spread out rather quickly, kind of like wildfire and lice, basically. So places that are uh, commonly in close quarters, like schools, especially with children, or any places that are kind of uh, uh, storage areas or even kind of 
uh, for um, sanctuaries and things like that in which people are kind of all piled up together really, really uh, close together, these have a tendency of spreading out really, really fast. So now, um, cleanliness, washing your hair kind of thing, and possibly even shaving it are the best solutions to them. Now, all of these kind of feed on blood, so there's that issue behind there, so they can um, have some damages, but they can also be carriers of a certain set of uh, bacterial infections. Not likely, but it's the, the louse itself, the lice in plural itself that becomes the issue. But I told you that story, so I can give you the last set of louse, known as the crab louse, or what most of you know as crabs, as a sexually transmitted infection. Now here, this is caused by a slightly different cousin of theirs called Theris pubis, which you should be able to kind of figure out the name or the location, I'm sorry, because of the name. Now that being said, um, what's interesting about this is that this one is uh, associated with uh, pubic hair, right? This is where this guy likes to attach itself. And that kind of produces the same idea of the blood meal, the itchiness and all that fun stuff associated with sexually transmitted infections. Now, before we end this story of our insects and move on to our uh, fungi to close it off, I want to show you the image that you're seeing on the left-hand side, is that what you're seeing there um, is a tissue that you should all be able to recognize where you see Theris pubis attached and the little egg sacs next to them. That is not, in this case, um, a pubic area. That's not what I'm showing you. That, if you haven't thought about it, are eyelashes. So I want you to kind of think for a second, why is it that it's there? So here we enter the final field of our classification, which are the group that most people associate with uh, mushrooms, which are the fungi. Okay. So here uh, we'll expand on the properties of our classic mushrooms. And here's the interesting piece. They're all eukaryotes and they all have to be mostly multicellular with one small exception. Um, and so they're very similar to most animals and plants. And so there's going to be a lot of overlap here. However, unlike our large animals and our large plants kind of thing, these guys don't quite grow into these bodies that kind of move around. Rather, they kind of extend. And so they grow through things called filaments. And their fancy name is called a hyphae. And so when you get enough of these filaments growing, enough of these hyphae, singular hypha, in case you're looking for it, um, they grow into a collection of them called a mycelium. And so the mycelium is pretty much the group of these filaments put together. And that's what most people identify from uh, mushrooms, right? Now, if they have a particular shape that all of you recognize, it's called a thallus, and you'll see that too. But most of the time, all of these cells are, uh, the cells of these organisms, like I said, are very filamentous, very kind of long and thread-like, and they're usually kind of connecting from end to end, right? And so what we're going to be uh, going through is just some of the examples of these. We don't really look at the classic mushroom because that one is not necessarily always um, of interest for microbiology, but certain groups of them are. So let's get onto those guys. One of the main things on how we classify mushrooms uh, is through how they produce their spores and how do they disperse them, right? So how do they spread the spores themselves? So unlike our protists, our protozoans, for those of you who remember that portion, and um, we classify them by motility, here we class them by the shape and the form of how they disperse the spores, right? And so what's really cool about them is they can produce these asexually or sexually, and depending on how they kind of go from one stage to the other, sometimes they can alternate those. And so we really kind of look at how they produce those spores and what version of those spores exist. So asexually speaking, which is going to be the more common version of these, there's a couple of exceptions here and there, um, is how they produce the spores that we're interested in. And we're going to look at the classifications that are really important for us. And there's only really one sexual version of producing these spores that we're going to be interested in. So these are all non-motile, so you don't really see them moving around with, again, one exception that I'm going to highlight in a second. Um, they all have this chitin wall that we're familiar with when we talked about cell walls. And as I told you, these kind of uh, chemo heterotrophs that we had talked about before happen to be a little bit more unique in which are saprophytic, meaning that you find these growing or surviving off of things that are dead or decaying. 
So, and then even some of them can become a little bit more extra damaging towards what they're uh, living on the dying things. They can be parasitic too. Now, most of them are aerobic, meaning that they do require oxygen for as a terminal electron acceptor or they die. But there is one exception to that rule that I keep on talking about, one weird one, which are your yeasts. Yeasts happen to be the only unicellular version of them um, and happen to be also facultative, meaning they can, can survive with or without that oxygen, okay? although they prefer oxygen anyway. The rest of them are all multicellular, and those are all kind of categorized into your classic mushrooms that you're all used to seeing, a lot of the molds, and then a couple of other variations called puffballs, rusts, and smuts, which are variations of these uh, fungi that can be, uh, they can grow in certain areas like plants and things like that too. Now, uh, in terms of reproduction, like I said, they undergo both sexual and asexual versions of their stages. So this is what we call dimorphic most of the time. So you'll see me highlight this when we're talking about those guys. And then, like I said, the last one we're kind of going to ignore more than anything else is the classic macro fungus or the one mushroom that you're all used to observing, right? Simply because that one doesn't really uh, contribute a lot to microbiology with, again, one tiny exception. So they're chemoheterotrophs. They absorb things. And so those uh, uh, filaments that I was talking about before, those hypha or hyphae in plural, when we're men uh, mentioning, kind of look like a little web, right? And so these webs kind of land on anything and then they start absorbing uh, nutrients through those uh, hypha. And so what's really neat about that is, again, they usually are going on things that are already dead or decaying. Now, every now and then, some of them, they can modify those hypha into something called a hostoria. And so those can actually um, become part of whatever they're lying on and then they can either be symbiotic and you know, help certain things or not harm them to all the way to being parasitic in which they do grow inside these things or on these things and then start surviving off of them and killing them. But like I said, most of them are aerobic uh, with the exception of yeast being the facultative anaerobe that is out there too. Now, so we're gonna focus specifically on yeasts and molds, which are really kind of what we're interested in uh, like I said, the classic macro fungus that everybody recognizes, this classic shroom that everybody's familiar with, not really going to be our focus in this case. Although I am going to provide you with one example just for observation, especially in the lab. Now, the issue again here is what the uh, textbook has as well as the lab manual because they have been reclassified as usual. And then brand new ones have been popping up very recently in the last year or so. So these guys have been being regrouped into a brand new uh, set of classification. So let me kind of give you the summary here really quick. Um, there are seven current classifications that we recognize with one brand new one about to pop up. And so I haven't listed it simply because even uh, that one's kind of under um, review for the moment. But out of them, there's seven classifications that you should be familiar with, which are the microsporidia, the glomeromycota, chytridium mycota, blastocladium mycota, neocalusum mastigum mycota, ascomycota, and basidium mycota. Those are all of them. Um, now, out of them, they're basically classified based on their spores and how they uh, disperse those spores and how they reproduce. So that's really the main way on how we're going to observe these. So going back to, again, the pieces that we wanted to highlight, remember that these guys all kind of reproduce uh, sorry, grow, I'm sorry, in terms of how their hypha extends. And so I'm going to show you two variations behind those. Um, there's the ones that we call pigmented versus unpigmented or kind of colorless or transparent almost. And so they have fancy names. So the ones that have color, they're called demediaceous. And the ones that are unpigmented or also kind of transparent D kind of thing, they're called monoliaceous or hyaline, the same term that you use in uh, cartilage for those of you aren't familiar with in A&P, like hyaline cartilage, same concept, same term. And then we subdivide them into how those hypha grow in terms of being just long and extended or uh, in terms of being continuous, I'm sorry, long and extended or kind of you know, building little walls in the middle. So these, the ones that are fully continuous are referred to as non-septate or aseptate. And the ones that have little separations in between the cells of each hypha 
These are called septate or septated also is the term. And like I said before, um, their life cycle, their reproduction cycles are fairly complex. So um, we're really gonna highlight more or less their asexual reproduction forms and the types of spores that they can produce. And with one exception, the sexual version of them that we're interested in. So what type of spores exist? So usually you'll hear the term uh, spore integrated into their name. There's the four that we're gonna highlight here are called conidia or conidia spores. They usually these spores kind of occur at the ends of those little hypha, those little filaments. Uh, the blastospores, they usually kind of occur by kind of subdividing themselves by budding. The arthrospores, the term arthro here again meaning joint, um, that usually occurs at the bends or breaks of the hypha, so at the joints of hypha. And then we have something called a chlamydospore, which is usually kind of a non-dividing uh, version or non-kind of reproductive version called a resting stage, also kind of found at the end of hyphae certain times. Okay, so those are it. So those are the main ones that I'm gonna highlight. And like I said before, they're all classified based on what spores they form and usually a little bit about the uh, septation of their hypha, so the filaments themselves. So here's the main ones that we're gonna highlight. These are the ones that I want you to know. And then I'm gonna kind of re-highlight everything in the order uh, that we started with. There's three main divisions that have changed a little bit. There used to be groups called Zygomycota, uh, Zygomycotina, Ascomyces, and things like that, that kind of now got re-changed or reclassified into new phyla. Now you notice it's a different term here. In mushrooms, we don't usually call them phyla. Even though it's the same classification and taxonomy, for some reason, our mycologists, the scientists that study shrooms and mushrooms uh, and fungi, call them divisions instead. But the term division and phylum mean the exact same thing. So phylum glomeromycota or division uh, glomeromycota is the exact same thing, in case you're wondering. Okay, so um, out of the seven that we're gonna be learning about, again, we're gonna focus on the yeasts, which happen to contribute for us medically and biologically, in, sorry, and industrially. And then we're gonna look at our molds, which all happen to mostly cause some sort of decay, if not uh, some sort of medical concerns. And we're gonna take a look at one of uh, the macrofungi or the fleshy fungus that kind of resemble a classic fungus, fungus that everybody's familiar with. So what are the ones that you probably wanna know that are important here? So we're gonna look at the ascomycota that is present in our lab. Um, we'll look at both their sexual and asexual types of spores. We'll find out that the zygomycetes that used to exist have been reclassified into something called glomeromycota, which is one of the main classifications out there and we're gonna look at their zygospores, which are really, really neat. And then we're gonna look at one particular uh, large fungus, um, which is known as a club fungus also, under the group of basidiomycota. So these are the ones that possess something called the basidium. And that basidium is what all of you recognize as these um, mushroom portions, that whole little cap or head that everybody sees in a mushroom, that's what we call a basidium. So that's Basidium mycota. And then the last one is also very similar to the protists in which we kind of got a group that we didn't know how to sort them out. There was the other ones, the rest of them that we didn't have enough information to kind of sort them out. And so those are known as the deuteromycetes that have been reclassified as well. So let's look at them in terms of their spores and how they classify. Now, asexually speaking, there's a couple of versions on how you create those spores. Some of them are known as sporangiospores, chlamydospores, and conidiospores. Okay, remember reminding you that the chlamydospores are the ones that are kind of solid and uh, are more of a resting stage. But the other two, the sporangiospores and the conidiospores, kind of grow in these very interesting uh, patterns. The sporangiospore that you're seeing up there, for example, um, is at the end of a hypha, at the end of a filament. And what you're seeing there is the stalk that carries it, called the sporangiophore. The term P-H-O-R-E means carrier. Okay? And then at the end, you actually see the little sack of uh, spores called the sporangium. Now, that being said, 
um, there's a slightly different variation of those. Instead of growing at the tips of them, they can kind of thicken and harden and grow at any stage as a way, as a way to be a resting stage. So these are called chlamydospores. And then lastly, probably the one we're going to be playing with a lot, especially in the lab, is the conidiospore and its little stalk called the conidiophore. And so these look like little bristles, like little brushes. And so at the end of the conidiophore, you'll see these conidia or conidiospores, and which each of those spores will can, can then be released and grow another hypha, right? And so under these versions, you can see ones that are not connected at all. So are usually kind of referred to as conidia. If they're kind of built at the joints, they'll be called arthroconidia. If they're kind of growing off of each other, they'll refer to as blastoconidia. And then the whatever carrier it is, is referred to as the four. Remember that P-H-O-R-E is the stock version of it. Now there is a sexual version of these in which the actual hypha themselves um, can fuse together akin to, again, a sexual version in terms of humans or other animals in which they have two versions, a kind of positive and negative counterpart to each other rather than calling them male and female because they really don't have those. And those can actually fuse together from a haploid stage or a half stage of cells like sperm and eggs and fuse them together to form a zygote. And so here uh, they form this fusal, uh, fusing portion of them called a dicarion. And then eventually that dicarion can then go on to produce more spores. So that's kind of a small variation in terms of being asexual versus sexual. So kind of let's look at it from one of the examples that we're gonna look in a moment or the type of organisms we're interested in here is that during the asexual stage, the left side of the image that you're seeing here is that these little stalks containing the spores will just release the spores out into the air or onto a surface and they're all asexual. That means that each one of those spores basically only contains half of the information, they're haploid, and each one of those spores will reproduce, or sorry, they will produce a hypha, another stock by itself. Alternatively, the sexual side of this story is in which two different stocks, two different hypha, can actually fuse together, bringing half the material from each side and bringing twice the material later on as they fuse. So kind of like us, a fertilized version of them called a zygospore or zygosporangium. And then that spore that is fused together will then form the little stalk and the uh, sack of spores. And that, that one will release um, the uh, haploid spores that they had originally. So there's small variations here from one to another. And that's it. That's really kind of as deep as we want to dive into the reproductive cycles of these guys. What we really want to do here is focus on the organisms that are key for us. Yeast probably being the more critical one um, in terms of two things. Medically speaking, uh, probably the more important one of them all is something called candida albicans, which causes something called candidiasis, uh, which also happens to be a uh, sexually transmitted infection, uh, which is assist associated with most uh, females called vaginitis. Um, but it can be spread to the skin and through the mouth also. This is called thrush. Um, for the same type of infection. Um, and so it can exist inside the lungs, it can go inside your intestines, or it can go more or less in reproductive areas too. So this bad boy is associated or important to us in terms of its medical impact or anything else. However, there are uh, industrial applications behind this. For example, the infamous one that we talked about earlier today during the example, the one that produces beer, for example, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, happens to be an ascomycete that uh, is the one responsible for uh, fermenting, in this case, things like barley and other uh, carbohydrate substances to produce things like beers. And then the other important one is the one that is involved in baking. So here we're talking about your classic baker's yeast, right? The same one that you will uh, buy at a store and the next time you want to create some cake, this is the guy you're going after. So there are both medically as well as industrial applications to these guys. Now, going away from the yeasts, we enter our last uh, group that we're interested in, which are our molds. And so here, these are all usually some sort of, again, medical or industrial application behind them. Here, the example of the infamous mold uh, known as Rizipus, 
Um, and there's several different ones you should be familiar with uh, that we will also observe under a microscope in the lab are Rhizopus stolonifer, Rhizopus orissus, and Rhizopus orizi. And so stolonifer is the one that you normally see when your bread goes bad. So that guy, uh, the next time you see seeing something kind of greenish, brownish, blackish growing on your bread, that's Rhizopus stolonifer right there. Um, and the other two, orissus and orizi, are involved and do into these very heavily damaging respiratory diseases called zygomycoses, in which those kind of clog parts of your alveoli and your lungs and cause anything from asthma to difficulty breathing to death sometimes. So there's two sides to that kind of application of Rhizopus. Now, Rhizopus happens to be one of those organisms that grows through uh, both sexually and asexually. So when you observe these under the microscope, you're going to see the sexual version of Rhizopus, in which you'll see the dicarion or the zygospore in it forming its little stalk and it's where it's about to be released. That's where that guy comes into play. Now, the other one I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is known as Aspergillus. Um, and the specific organism uh, that we had mentioned before is um, Aspergillus niger, which is the one we use in, in, in the industry, right? But in this case, uh, this guy is associated with what you know as a respiratory disease known as the black mold or white ring mold. So this is the guy that you kind of, um, you see outside, you know, sorry, outside, inside in your bathroom, that kind of thing growing on. Or you might have seen it in some of the, uh, even your plates that you guys growing at home, right? And so one of the versions, Aspergillus fumigatus, um, causes a, another respiratory disease called aspergillosis. Um, and can also kind of uh, worsen cases of asthma. But then the other ones that I mentioned earlier during the examples are Aspergillus soy and orizi, which are also involved in the production of soy. And so anything from the fermentation of it to produce soy sauce to uh, certain uh, growth of soybeans and things like that too. So these are uh, common in kind of croplands and horticultural workers, which is the most common case. And if you've ever had a bad name associated with some sort of uh, spore growing out of something, this is usually associated with like Egyptian mummies and sometimes, sometimes people opening in a uh, sarcophagus or something like that and people claiming that they've been cursed because they died, it's usually because they released this guy. So uh, the spores get released, they get caught into their lungs, they can't breathe and they usually die. So no curse, just a little fungus that got released usually. And then um, the other one that we'll talk about, probably because it has a far more powerful name associated with it, which is penicillium. And so penicillium here um, is known as a green mold, and it's probably the infamous one that everybody's familiar with is penicillium notatum, which is the one where uh, penicillin was discovered from. Um, but now we actually use a cousin of penicillium notatum to grow and actually develop penicillin or its derivatives. But if it's not for antibiotics, or the, at least the creation and discovery of antibiotics, we also have the other two penicillin, which are penicillin Rook 40 and Camemberti, which are both responsible for producing cheeses. Again, uh, Roquefort cheese and Camembert cheese come from these guys in particular. So medically important in terms of antibiotics, but also uh, industrially important because of food. Now, uh, one of the other groups or phyla or divisions that we're familiar with are the microsporidia, which uh, happens to be parasitic and also uh, lack mitochondria, very similar to some of our protists. And so these guys possess something called a mitosome, which is kind of the earlier version of the mitochondrion, if you will, also or a alternative to it, not necessarily an earlier version. Um, now, these guys happen to be parasitic. And the greater majority um, kind of hit other animals and certain insects and things like that, but a small amount of them do hit humans. And so um, a very small percentage of them can actually hit humans and animals, but out of the ones that kind of do hit us can be relatively damaging and a few of them can be lethal. And so some of them can be used as biological or natural pesticides too. But for us, uh, the two big ones that kind of we're concerned about in terms of microsporidia um, is the one that in this case, when it accumulates in your eyes, for example, it can harden the sclera of your eyeball and make you go blind. This is known as keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, 
And so encephalotazone helum is the one that causes that guy. And encephalotazone intestinalis, same idea, uh, but probably a disease that's far more prominent called is microsporidiosis. So microsporidia causing a disease in the uh, intestines. And so what this guy does, it gets into the gut of the host um, and then the spore kind of germinates, it pops, it grows. And so what it does, it kind of builds up osmotic pressure um, until it kind of destroys the uh, cell uh, membrane and then causing them to kind of leak out. And so at that point in time, it kind of destroys the intestinal lining and some really, really, really bad diarrhea basically from that one. And so you, it can force you to kind of leak out. So those are the ones that I wanted to highlight for the mushrooms simply because they have uh, certain uh, aspects of medical or industrial importance. So what I'm going to close off with is my final two slides on this topic are the lichens, which is also part of our labs. And so under the lichens is a very unique classification that is uh, interest, uh, interesting to study because of how they grow. Here is going to be our very first scenario in which it's not necessary, necessarily a taxonomy. There's no taxon here. Instead, it's two separate organisms kind of growing together in this mutualistic behavior. In other words, they're helping each other out. And so here we take a fungus and we take an algum. So here what we're seeing is an early version of a bacterium as well as a um, fungus kind of combining together. And so when these two, two organisms combine, they create something called a lichen. And so lichens, um, what they are is a mushroom that is in its, in its hypha has become the protective coat of the bacterium. And so the mushroom version of this is called a mycobiont. And then the uh, cyanobacteria or the algae version of this is called the phycobiont. And so as you can see from the images here, what happens is the fungus, the hyphae, the filaments that we've been talking about a lot, kind of form the, form the outside coat of it. And then the algae kind of hide inside of it. And so what this fungus does is it forms a seal around the cyanobacteria, around the algae. And so the idea is really neat. The fungus uh, protects the uh, al uh, algae and cyanobacteria from dying, uh, and sorry, drying or desiccating, meaning it keeps it wet, moist. And then the cyanobacterium, for that price of protection, it provides it with energy. Cyanobacteria are photosynthetic and phototrophic which means that they produce their energy from sunlight. And as long as they have a little bit of water, they're good to go. So this kind of combination is really neat. The fungus keeps it from drying out. And while it has water and sunlight, the algae and cyanobacterium will provide the food towards the fungus. And so you get this mutualistic relationship of uh, a fungus and a bacterium all supporting each other under the sun as long as there's water. And so what you're seeing on the right-hand side is kind of the cross sections of these lichens and we'll get to show you some of them in the lab. So how do we classify them if you will? Because it's two organisms put together so you can't really give you valid taxonomy. So instead we only kind of sort them out. We don't give them a phylum, we don't give them a class or anything like that. So they're kind of just grouped based on their uh, morphologies. And so most uh, places describe the top three which are called the fruticos, folios, and crustos versions of them, in which the um, fruticos version of the lichens look like little bushes, which is what you're seeing on the top right-hand side. And probably the most infamous of them all is vulpina, uh, which is known as the wolf lichen. There's other ones that look like little leaves. And so uh, these are called uh, folios ones, kind of like foliage, right? And then there are ones that look kind of powdery, and so these are referred to as the crustos ones, simply kind of more of a crusty look, uh, look behind them. However, there are more variations than that that are usually listed in even textbooks. Um, and they're also, again, based on what they look like. Uh, for example, the one that you're seeing a little bit further down is called the lepros one. And so it's more like a powdery looking one. Um, and there's definitely things like uh, bisoid ones that kind of look like uh, more thick versions of wolf lichens. And then there's definitely ones that just don't have shapes and are referred to as structureless. But us for in the lab, we're actually kind of going to show you three different versions of them, which are the fruticose, folios, and crustose versions. And that pretty much kind of highlights all the material that we need to know.
from topic F all the way down to the uh, fungi. So we've covered everything from our archaea to bacteria to our protists to our parasites, both large and small in this case, so the regular parasites and the ectoparasites outside. And then we hit our mushrooms, which include the lichens. And that's the subject of this entire copy of classification part one.